announcements today. Uh, going through, everybody, everybody should have a copy of the bulletin. There's the announcements in the back. Um, the ladies' group is still making uh, Christmas, uh, 10 a.m. to 12 on um, July the 30th. They need some help with that, so please come out and give them a hand if you can. Uh, July 31st and August 1st and 2nd, they're having Wee Wednesdays here. Water Day will be on the July 31st. And, um, Please bring your children out to that August 4th, Sunday, uh, next Sunday. And, and yes, ma'am. Right. Water Day is going to be uh, on the 2nd. Water Day is going to be on the 2nd? That's Friday. Okay. Not Wednesday, so please change that. Okay. Water Day will be on the 2nd, not on the 31st. So add that to your calendar. Um, next Sunday is Sunday School Promotion. Uh, uh, during Sunday school and the blessing of the backpacks um, will be during the service. Um, there's a few committee meetings coming up this week. Um, after church today, we'll have a staff support meeting right after church. Um, then two weeks from now, August the 11th, uh, we'll have a meal after church to welcome the pa Pastor Steer and his family to the church. So everybody bring, please bring a covered dish for that. Um, are there any other announcements? All right, we'll prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude.
say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins, and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment for reflection and silent prayer. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name Amen. by the mercy of god we are united with jesus christ and in him we are forgiven we rest now in his peace and we rise every morning to serve him amen would you join me oh no i'm gonna skip it over already well good morning i am so glad to see each and every one of you i've met a few new folks again today please continue to give me your names uh, uh, it's going to be a, a challenge maybe i'll i'll talk to some of the committees we'll do a name tag sunday or something uh in a couple of weeks uh, but we're so glad you are here we continue our sermon series this morning the story of the bible but take a moment and greet those who are around you tell them you're glad that they're here Hey, how you doing, Ryan? Very good. Thanks for making that drive. Hey, sweet. How you doing? Good morning again, Alan. Good morning. How you doing? Good morning, y'all. Good morning. all too friendly now. Please join me as we uh, do our opening litany adapted from Psalm 1. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the riverbank. Their leaves never wither. And we worship you, dear Lord, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Old Testament reading. Please continue to be standing. Old Testament readings today are from Genesis 1, 26-31, and Exodus 16, 1-10. Genesis 1. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. The next reading is from Exodus 16, 1 through 10. Then the whole community of Israel set out from Elam and journeyed into the wilderness of Sin, between Elam and Mount Sinai. They arrived there on the 15th day of the second month. 
one month after leaving the land of Egypt. There too, the whole community of Israel complained about Moses and Aaron. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. There were... There sat around pots filled with meat and ate all the bread we wanted. But now you have brought us into the wilderness and starved us all to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the food can go out. Each day the people can go out and pick as much food as they need for that day. I will test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they will gather food and they prepare it. There will be twice as much as usual. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, by evening you will realize it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord because he has heard your complaints which are against him, not against us. We, what we, what have we done that you should complain about us? Then Moses added, the Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening and bread to satisfy you in the morning for he has heard all your complaints against him. What have we done? Yes, your complaints are against the Lord, not against us. Then Moses said to Aaron, Announce this to the entire community of Israel. Present yourselves before the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole community of Israel, they looked out toward the wilderness. There they could see the awesome glory of the Lord in the cloud. Time for the children's moment. Do you normally know what your mom's voice sounds like? 
or your dad's voice as they're coming in? You recognize it, right? That is it. Well, they recognized Jesus' voice, and so once they heard him say that, they knew that Jesus was there, and they knew that they didn't have to be afraid anymore. <clears throat> and so he got into the boat, and when he got into the boat, David, do you remember what happened? He, um, he did what? Hmm? Stop the storm? Yeah, he calmed the storm. And then the, yeah, and the, the um, disciples were super shocked. Yeah, they were. But he calmed the storm. And we're always kind of in that same boat. So if you're not afraid of the dark, are you afraid of some other things, maybe? Because sometimes things come up on you, like maybe you've know, been afraid of the first day of school. You get nervous, right? Not sometimes really. you just don't know what to expect. I'm not really ready for the big pictures yet. Oh, it's when it's I, okay. When I had to work in the show. So there are things that we're scared of. But who do we need to invite into our hearts and into our lives and ask to be with us? Right, Jesus, right? Because if he's with us, just like he was with the disciples and calmed the storm, is he going to calm our fears? Right? Are we going to know that we are always safe when we ask him to be with us and help us and calm our nerves during those times? Yes, just like he did for the disciples. So let's say a short prayer this morning. Now repeat after me. Dear God, all of us are afraid at times. Help us to remember that with Jesus, as our protector and friend, we have nothing to fear. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. All right, y'all have a great week and don't forget your bulletin. welcome you back or welcome you here for the first time, whatever the, the case may be. Uh, we are in a series called The Story of the Bible. Today is part two. Don't worry. If you missed part one, you can always go and look online and, and watch it later. Um, but you won't be lost. So this isn't like one of those soap operas where if you miss one episode, you're just totally, totally lost in what's going on. And the reason I wanted to do this series, the reason I'm so glad you're here or maybe watching online is because, as I said last week, most people, Christians, non-Christians, even people from other religions, most people may know parts of some Bible stories, but most people don't know the story of the Bible. In fact, one of the reasons it's been so easy to dismiss the Bible, the reason it's so easy to dismiss Christianity or for so many to walk away from their childhood faith is because, well, the people told you Bible stories as you were growing up, nobody sat you down and told you the story of the Bible. Well, part of the reason they didn't tell you the story of the Bible is when you were little, you wouldn't have been interested. But the other reason the people didn't tell you the story of the Bible is because in many instances, the people that handed you your first Bible didn't know the story of the Bible themselves. But friends, this is a really big deal. It's a really big deal in our culture. It's a really big deal in your life. It's a big deal for us as Christians. And it may be even a bigger deal if you or somebody you knew grew up in the faith and then walked away from their faith because understanding how we got the Bible is almost as important as the stories that are in it. So just to get us started, Jesus didn't write it. In fact, Jesus didn't write any of it. But here's some new information for most people, especially if you walked away from faith or you, um, you know, didn't know the story of the Bible. While Jesus didn't write it, Jesus is the reason that we have it. The story of the Bible begins not in Genesis. The story of the Bible begins when Jesus was discovered alive after the crucifixion. It's so important to know, as we talked about last week, if Jesus had been crucified and didn't rise from the dead, the Bible wouldn't exist. There would have been nothing to write about. The reason men decided to document the life of Jesus isn't just because of what he taught. It wasn't just because of the miracles that he did. It wasn't that he was crucified by Rome. Lots of people were. But that the tomb was...
was discovered empty. And when the disciples saw him alive, they went into the streets of Jerusalem. They proclaimed not what they had read about, not what they had heard about, but what they saw with their very own eyes. A resurrected Savior. And the church began. And so the events surrounding the life of Jesus, this resurrected rabbi, were extremely important to first century followers. Many people attempted to write down an orderly account of the life of Jesus. Not just a few, many. So consequently, we have this document that we call Matthew, the account of Jesus' life. There's Mark, there's Luke, and John. And as soon as these were written, now they were written at different times, but as soon as they were written, they were immediately considered valuable. And very quickly, these four documents were considered by the early church to be scripture. But it is important to understand after the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written, there still was know the Bible. There was just four accounts of the life of Jesus that the early church held in high regard and would eventually risk their lives to protect. So that's where the story picks up this week. The Apostle Paul and the others left Judea and began telling Gentiles, that's anybody that's not Jewish, they began telling the Gentiles about the claims of Jesus and the biggest transition and the biggest struggle for the Gentiles who were enamored by the life of Jesus. The message of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus was this. The whole idea of giving up everything that they had been brought up to believe. The struggle was giving up everything that everybody around them had been brought up to believe and embracing the idea, get this, this radical idea that there was only one God. Now, I know for us, this is a very much a no-brainer because we're not polytheists. Most of us don't live in a polytheist society. So the entire ancient non-Jewish world was expected, in order to become Christian, to embrace this notion that there was only one God. This was unimaginable. Now, it's important to know, in ancient times, people didn't just bounce around and convert from one religion to another religion. They, they didn't leave Islam to become Christian or leave Christianity to become Buddhist or leave Buddhism to become Hindu. That's not how it worked in the ancient world. Every religion, every region, every nation, the barbarians, the Romans, the earlier Greeks, every nation had their own gods and most families had family gods. They, they worshiped their ancestors and so when you moved to someplace else, you just went to your altar, you picked up your gods, you put them in a sack and you just went over to your next place. You set up your house, you took them out, set up your new altar to your, your gods and your family gods. That was just the way thing was. And nobody else really cared what gods that you worshiped or who you served. And as I said last week, the Roman Empire really didn't care who you worship as long as you paid homage to Caesar and as long as you didn't dishonor the Roman gods you could keep your household gods you could keep your family gods it just didn't matter and then Christianity comes along and says no you have to give up all those gods so this was a bit of an obstacle for the Gentiles who embraced Christianity but more and more in different parts of the world Gentiles came to faith in Jesus but the idea idea of there being one God, it just seemed to many to be very novel, to be very new. But for the most part, the Gentile people had virtually no interest in the Jewish religion and virtually no interest in the Jews themselves until they were introduced to the gospel, the teachings of Jesus and the claims of Jesus. And until they were confronted by the Apostle Paul and Peter and others who were eyewitnesses to this resurrection. But to their amazement, they discovered the Jews whose religion was older than the religion of the Romans, older than the religion of the Greeks. They discovered that the Jewish people had always, from the very beginning, only believed in one God, Yahweh. Now, here's a little bit of history before we get back to the plot line, because this is so important. During the first century, second, even third century, Christians were persecuted by the Romans because the Christians, as we said last time, would not worship the gods and would not declare that Caesar was Lord. 
but the Jews had never honored or worshipped the Roman gods. The Jews had never declared that Caesar was Lord. So a question that you may have never asked, but you should be asking now is this. Why is it that the empire, the Roman empire, gave the Jews a pass, but they persecuted the Christians? The Jews were just as guilty as the Christians of not declaring Caesar as their Lord, not honoring any of the Roman gods, but the Romans left the Jews alone. And do you know why? Do you know why Rome allowed the Jews to have a past as it was related to Caesar, related to their pantheon of gods? It's because Rome honored ancient things. And the Romans knew that the Jewish religion was older than the pantheon of Greek gods. They recognized that the Jewish scripture and the Jewish religion was older than any other religion, any belief system that they ever encountered. So even though they, the Romans at this time, didn't honor Yahweh as God, they honored the fact that the Jewish religion was older than their religion. So the Jews get a pass. So when these Gentile Christians begin for the first time exploring Jewish scripture, they are shocked to discover that the oldest religion that anybody knew about had recognized that there was only one God from the very beginning. The implications were staggering. The implications were that since ancient times, every other nation that worshipped multiple gods, every family that worshipped their ancestors, every single culture since ancient times had it wrong. And the Jews knew this from the very beginning. They opened up, they unscrolled the first segment of the Jewish text that we call Genesis, and here's what they found. In the beginning, God. Now, we've all heard this so many times. You've read this so many times. You've argued about this so many times. You've disputed whether or not it's true or who wrote it. But don't miss the original context. Don't miss the implications of the original context. This was shocking to the ancient world because what they expected to find was what they found in all the non-Jewish cults and the, the creation stories that were floating around at the time. They expected to read in the beginning the gods. But God? Now the word Genesis is a Greek word that actually means origin. It's the first book in our English Bible. We know that Moses wrote the first five books of our English Bible and of the Jewish text. But something very interesting happened that has affected every single one of you in this room. You probably didn't even know it. Here's what happened in the late 19th and early 20th century. Archaeological finds made the claims of what we find in Genesis a little suspect. In the 19th and the 20th century, archaeological finds created doubt regarding the origins of the Jewish or the Genesis creation account. And here's where those doubts came from. They found Egyptian, Sumerian, Canaanite, and Babylonian creation text. And they discovered these texts and they, hey, they were very similar, or so they thought, to the Hebrew text. They were so similar that the initial assumption was that the ancient Hebrew text actually borrowed from the other creation stories. And the assumption is, look, this didn't come from God. The, the ancient Hebrews just borrowed from all of these other stories to make up their own. So it's just one of many stories that are floating around out there. So why take it seriously? The point being, it's, it's not unique. But what you guys need to know, because who keeps up with this stuff besides Bible nerds like me, what you need to know is that view has pretty much been abandoned in scholarship. Not only does Genesis not borrow from other creation myths, Genesis stands in startling contrast to the other ancient creation stories. Their friends, Genesis is a world view unto itself. An extraordinary, ahead of its time worldview. In fact, the scientific community, the modern scientific community, wouldn't even begin to catch up with the first statement in Genesis until 1927. It's when a Belgian priest first suggested the theory that we now call the Big Bang Theory, and that the universe actually had a beginning. 
Maybe you didn't know this, now you will. Since the time of Aristotle in the 4th century BC, everybody pretty much assumed that the universe just existed. It had always existed, that matter just was. Albert Einstein embraced this idea that the universe had always existed, but in 1964, with the discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation, maybe some of you even remember studying this in school, the view that the universe had always existed was abandoned. Scientists pretty much agree that in a trillion trillionth of a second, the universe expanded at an extraordinary speed from something smaller than the size of a, pe a pebble to its astronomical size that we now can try to observe but can't even find the edges of it. Or, in the words of Genesis, in the beginning, in the beginning, God spoke and bang, it happened. The significance of what comes next is lost on us. And the reason it is lost on us is because the point that my, Moses is trying to make is already assumed by us and even by our culture. To say it in a different way, Moses is building a case that no longer needs to be built because his argument ultimately succeeded. Moses is writing to an ancient group of people who all they know is slavery. All they know is the power of the Egyptian gods, this Ennead of gods. And so Moses is trying to help them to narrow their focus, to re-believe, if you will, to become atheists as it relates to the Egyptian gods and become believers again in the one God, Yahweh. So in Genesis, Moses is making the point that God created the heavens and the earth, not the gods, just Yahweh. And so he says, in the beginning, God created. Not Egypt's Ra or Babylon's Marmaduke who rode into the epic battle of the gods. In Genesis, we find something extraordinarily different. Not even close. No similarity. No borrowing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis is nothing like the Egyptian creation myth. It's nothing like the Canaanite creation myth. It's nothing like the Babylonian creation myth. In these myths, the gods are at odds with themselves. The gods are at war with each other. Then the gods actually create other gods out of body parts and out of body fluids. And this brings up the next epic ahead of its time statement. And friends, don't miss this. This is extraordinary. In all of the ancient creation myths, mankind is an afterthought. To take the load off the gods, to, to lighten the load for the gods, to be helpers. Genesis is completely different. Now, because of the way that ancient people embraced these ancient mythologies about their gods, individuals had absolutely no rights. Women had no status, no hope. There was no intrinsic value in anyone. The violence, the injustice of the gods justified the violence and the injustice of their leaders. The, the kings of these foreign nations and these pagan cults were essentially acting like their fathers in heaven. And then you come to Genesis, which is in stark contrast, no parallel, nothing even close. A concept that the human race, sadly, is still struggling with and trying to catch up to to this very day. Genesis tells us, remember, the religion that is older than any of the other religions that were known to exist in the first century. Genesis says what no pagan myth said. It said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Now, I can go on for another 15 minutes talking about who that conversation is between. If you want to talk about that, see me after church. I can uh, talk about that with you. But did you ever think about that? Let us make man in our image. Now, get back with me. Okay, leave that. Write it down. Make a note. Okay, I want you right back here with me this morning. In the Jewish text, the creation of mankind is the pinnacle of creation. It's not some afterthought, which means, don't miss this, dignity. The dignity of every man, the dignity of every woman, the dignity of every child is established at the very beginning. Friends, this was and is unheard of. There is no parallel anywhere. The pagan mythologies and the pantheon of gods that would develop after this through the ages 
none of them establish this kind of thought or this kind of idea, but there's more. What comes next is even more unthinkable and more unma unimaginable. And that's why later archaeologists, later scholars decided, you know what? <laughs> the Jews didn't borrow from any of these ancient myths. This myth, that's what they consider, they consider Genesis a myth. This myth is far and away different. Again, it is a worldview unto itself. Because what comes next is completely unimaginable. It would have been unimaginable 500 years later, 5,000, 1,500 years later, 2,000 years later, and this would still be unimaginable to some today. And here's what the text says in Genesis chapter 1. We're still in there. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that he may rule over. Not worship, not make idols out of, not deify, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and over all the wild animals. In the very beginning, God told the Jewish people, you will make no idols. You will make no images of me, Yahweh. You will make no idol or image out of an animal or out of people or anything that crawls on the ground or flies in the air. You will have no other gods before me because there are no other gods. I'm telling you, friends, this is in stark contrast to the Egyptian Iliad of gods that the Hebrews had just been delivered from. God says, you will not worship nature. Think about this. You will not worship nature. You will rule over nature. You will subdue it. The implication being you are the stewards of this world. Again, an idea that we are still struggling to the ground this very day. And every single pagan culture following the establishment of the Jewish people worshipped nature or the elements of nature or the animals of nature, all kinds of weird mixtures of humans and animals of nature. So from the very beginning, God established a unique worldview. God created mankind in his image. Unthinkable. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. Now, the image of God is repeated. It's here twice for emphasis. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Mic drop. I could leave right now, but I'm not going to. Ladies, look up here for just a moment. I think every woman should be a Christian and should fully embrace Christianity. Do you know that Jesus was the first in the ancient world to elevate the status of women? That's why so many women follow Jesus. But ladies, in the very beginning, the God of the Jews, who became the God of the Christians, gave you dignity, the type of dignity that our world is still trying to catch up to this very day. And only recently, historically speaking, has civilization begun to wrestle the way it needs to wrestle with the dignity of men and women and children, born and pre-born. And it was there in the very beginning. Now, our problem with this is we get distracted. Because when we read Genesis, we fight over the questions of how or when or why. Or is a day really a day? Mo friends, Moses, this is no exaggeration. Moses dropped a bomb in the very beginning. Moses introduced a radically different, unparalleled, untested worldview. And this would be the foundation of what would later be called the golden rule. And the golden rule is not reflected anywhere in nature. And let's be honest, it's not reflected anywhere in human nature either. But the idea was introduced at the very beginning when God said, you are not a means to an end. You are not to worship nature. I am going to make you as close to me as possible. I am going to make you in my image. Which means that every man, every woman, every child is you and you and you and those folks watching online. 
bear the image of their creator. So friends, we must be careful how we treat one another, shouldn't we? According to the Uma Elish, you were born a slave to the gods. According to the Uma Elish, you have no individual identity, no individual dignity, no rights. There is no redeemer and there is no afterlife. According to the new atheists, you were born a slave to your DNA. You have no free will. There is no redeemer. And again, there is no afterlife. But in the very beginning, we are introduced to a God who saves, who redeems, who delivers, and who never, ever gives up on you. And all of this is in the beginning. A God who gives us freedom to choose and then honors our choice to choose against him. And then Yahweh does the most ungodly thing imaginable. He goes to work to reverse the consequences of mankind's decision to choose against him. In Genesis 1, he creates, he gives us, and provides us the meta-narrative of our lives. The big picture, if you will. The ultimate context for the human experience. A monotheistic worldview. A worldview, and please don't miss this. A worldview that answers life's most important questions. The why questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? But more personally, why are you here? Why do you matter? And the answer, you are here on purpose and you are here with a purpose. You are not the result of some cosmic conflict between the gods. You are not created by the universe. God wanted image bearers who could relate to one another and could relate to him. And here's my favorite part. When the time was right, when everything was just as it needed to be, Yahweh the God of Genesis joined us. Think about that. In the opening line of the Hebrew Bible, they realize something that is very difficult for the first century Jews to acknowledge. In the opening line of the scripture that they, the Gentiles, began to adopt as their own scripture, they realized that the Jews had it right all along. Which, of course, only fueled their interest in the law and the prophets and the Hebrew scriptures. And they moved very quickly to adopt the Hebrew scriptures or the Hebrew Bible or the law and the prophets as their own Christian scriptures. And thus, the stage was set for the inclusion of the Jewish scriptures in the Christian Bible. But that inclusion would not be without its struggles. So please, please, don't miss part three of the story of the Bible. Amen. Amen. If you are able, I would encourage you to stand and we will sing, It Is Well With My Soul.
things aside, the, the thoughts of the message, the thoughts of the things you want to do this day, this week, or the things that you maybe didn't get to last week, and let's just focus on interceding for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and even bringing our own petitions to him. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you with praise on our lips because you, from the very beginning, gave each and every one of us dignity. A dignity, Lord, that we struggle sometimes to accept or to give to others. A dignity that our world does not share. Lord, we, we thank you for, for Dorothy Sue, the birth of a beautiful little baby girl. Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of life. But Lord, even in that praise, at times we are heartbroken by what happens in our society and all around us. There are so many who don't get that chance. Lord, we pray for them. We pray for those who've had this kind of tragedy touch their hearts and their lives. And we pray, Lord, that your healing would come upon them, would come into them, Lord. Father, we pray for all who, who desperately desire to have children, but for one reason or another, Lord, you have decided that it is not to be. We thank you, Lord, for the fostering process and adoption and just those who are gifted to be able to bring children into their hearts, Lord, who maybe aren't theirs biologically, but we could never argue that they aren't their children, Lord. And Father, we continue to, to lift you as Suki, Lord, for healing. We continue to bring you Deb. We thank you for the progress that she is making, Lord. We pray for her swift return and that she would be restored to health. Lord, we pray for Mary Ellen, also with post-surgery recovery, Lord. Father, we lift you, Jake, as he recovers again from yet another surgery. And Lord, we bring you our nation, our state, and our county. Father, we're in another one of those tumultuous times called an election year. And Father, help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and help us to love the neighbors that you have put around us. But Lord, also help us to speak your truth, to speak your word. And on that day in November when we go and we cast those ballots, Lord, help us not to leave our faith outside that curtain, but help us to vote based on what you tell us in your word, Lord. Father, we lift to you, Deb and Ron, as they progress through this uh, terrible disease. Lord, just be with them. Give them an extra measure of grace. Father, we thank you for our military, our firefighters, our, our law enforcement. Uh, Lord, all of our first responders who rush in when others flee, those who make sacrifice. And it's not just the men and women who are overseas. It is their families, Lord, that are left behind. So when we mention these men and these women, we are also thinking about and praying for their families, Lord. And this morning, we give you Warren and Stephen, Conrad and Connor and Cece and so many others. Lord, help them to be safe. Help them to be secure. But Lord, also help them to be a light in the darkness as they serve in various branches of the military or as first responders, Lord. Father, we lift you our ministry partners, Danny and Rebecca Deloche, Lord, as they do Bible translation work in New Guinea. We lift you John and Carol, Lord, also Bible translators. Lord, we bring you Christian, Kristen and the staff at the Truton House and Amber and the Hosanna Helpers, Lord. Help us to, to continue to look around and see where you are working so that we may join you in your work. And Lord, we give you thanks. We give you praise every single day because we know not only do you hear our prayers, but you answer them. And Lord, we ask for your grace to accept those answers that we don't understand, even the ones that we don't like. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please stand and join me in our offering prayer. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
please be seated. Well, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord, our Savior, he took the bread and he blessed it, and then he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. supper he took the cup and again he blessed it and he gave it to his disciples and said take and drink this is the new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins as often as you do this do this in remembrance of me so we drink this cup we eat this bread yes remembering what Christ did some 2,000 years ago but also clinging to his promise of his presence his forgiveness and a life everlasting with him. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom of the ushers, all who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior are welcome to partake. Let us sing a new day. Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. 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 The Lord bless you and keep you and be with you always. The body of Christ given for you you and keep you and be with you always the body of the Lord bless you and keep you and be with you always the body of Christ given for you the Lord bless you and keep you and be with you always the body of Christ given for you the body of Christ given for you the Lord bless you and keep you and be with you always
keep you and be with you always. and keep you and be with you always. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The Lord bless you and keep you and be with you always. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. you and keep you and be with you always the body of christ given for you the lord bless you and keep you and be with you always the body of christ given for you the body of christ given for you the body of christ given for you the body of christ given for you
Christ given for you. The body of 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 Christ given for you. stand for a blessing. Now may the body and blood of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep you in the days to come. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray the prayer of thanksgiving. Pour, about, pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, as we unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. May the God of peace fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Amen. Let us sing Amazing Grace.